So we are really excited to be here in London. Uh, the, the, I guess the best place to talk about open banking, PSD2, and its role in digital transformation. When Zaytun mentioned PSD2 and, and when I mentioned PSD2 as well, I just saw a couple of eyes lighting up. You guys must be from the financial services. Now, to begin with, I have some bad news. It turns out no one wakes up in the morning and thinks, I want to do my banking today. Despite assurances from most of our banks that these attractive investment advices are going to take you each step of the way into your investment journey, um, we are a little skeptical. Because most of the time when we do go to the bank to get their services, it turns out these two guys, or this guy and girl, are on leave. So, instead, what most people wake up to in the morning wishing was if they were getting that well-deserved holiday in the beautiful beaches of Sri Lanka, or on a more uh, longer-term um, list, uh, you're probably thinking, I want to buy that dream home. Or on a more selfless note, you want to educate your children. And then, of course, the wish list for different people is different, and it goes on. But the thing is that you need banking, and you need to interact with the banking services in order to get to any of these items in your wish list. So banking is not really the end goal, but it is a means to that end goal. And we all wish that this journey towards that end goal in our wish list was very quick and pleasant. Sometimes we wish that it could be like electricity. Very important, absolutely necessary, but so much in the background that you don't feel it. I bet nobody walked into this hall today and thought, gosh, the electricity in this place is amazing. Did anyone think that? I don't think so. And yet, electricity is powering up all these screens. It's helping you hear me very well. It's keeping us warm, hopefully. But it's so much in the background that even though we are, our, our lives are so much better with electricity in it, we have completely forgotten about it. And we wish that banking can also be like that, where we don't really feel that we are using it or that we are really banking, but it gets us to that end goal swiftly and surely. So banking has come a long way in this aspect, but we are nowhere near the ideal situation. Let me give you a few examples. How many times have you seen advertisements like this and realize that you have the wrong card? How many times have you wanted to finally, after so many days and months and some, in certain cases, years of searching around, looking for that house that fits, your, fits the picture in your mind and fits your budget, and then start your um, uh, journey towards getting a mortgage, how many times have we thought, this is just too much? The paperwork, the documentary proof that needs to be provided in order to get to that end goal is just not worth it. Sometimes a dream home, that the dream of getting that dream home swiftly but surely turns into a nightmare. And when you experience that incomprehensible joy of becoming new parents, and you want to do the right thing from the start, and you try to start investing on your children's education, and you're given all these different combinations and options from different banks, that's when you really wonder whether you need to revisit your own education before saving for that of your children. So the thing is that um, even though the, the banking is a journey towards an end goal, right now it is not at an ideal, ideal level. So while this is the status quo for banking, not just in Europe, but in most parts of the world, the European Commission came up with a new regulation. It's a Revised Payment Services Directive, more fondly known as PSD2, 
It applies to all banks operating in the EU, and it has a compliance deadline of January 13, 2018, two months and six days away from today. So for the benefit of everyone in the audience, I'm sure most of you already know this, but let me just encapsulate what this regulation means. It basically mandates banks to securely expose customer account and payment data with the customer's consent to regulated third parties via APIs. Securely expose customer account and payment data with customer's consent, of course, to regulated third parties via APIs. Why is this important to us? And why is it important to the customers? This is going to change customer experience in two different ways, and I'll show you how it does. Let's look at the first. So most of us have multiple bank accounts um, spread across different banks. We would have our savings accounts, we'd have our checking accounts, we'd have a couple of cre credit cards, we'd have a mortgage in there, and most of the time they are not all in the same bank. So at any given point in time, even though we have funds spread across um, different entities of the banking system, we have no idea about our consolidated financial picture. If we want to understand how our funds are distributed and how they are being invested at, uh, presently in order to maybe um, make a payment or in order to combine funds that are spread across different banks to make a payment or in order to understand how to move the funds around to different banks and different accounts in order to get a better investment. We currently don't have much support in doing that unless we want to do that ourselves. In the PSD2 world, the banks are now opening up this data, exposing this customer financial data to regulated third parties with the customer's consent via APIs, right? So this allows third party providers, and I've said TPP over there, and this, this type of third party is specifically called account information service provider, to consume that data from multiple banks on behalf of the customer and provide that in a very user-friendly way to the customer so that they can understand exactly what their consolidated financial picture is and do whatever changes they want to do based on the information provided for them. So what this looks like for the customer, for example, is something like this, and it could be better than this. The customer is able to see his account balances across different banks, he can consolidate them into one single value. He can look at the transactions done uh, using different accounts. He can look at different types of transactions. He can look at the, um, um, the history of how his balances changed. And of course, this can be done in very many ways. But this is just a snapshot of the possibilities. So in terms of personal finance, it's very useful. But in terms of business banking, this is even more useful because now enterprises are able to better manage their finances, ensure smooth cash flow, and, in, and do their investments in a very, very effective and optimized way because they have the full picture in front of them and they have all the information that they need in order to do better investments. Let's take a look at the second type of customer experience. And this relates to payments. Now, right now, especially if you're doing online transactions, we have to rely on the credit card network to do that. So when we do a credit card transaction, what happens is that we provide our credit card information to a merchant, and then the merchant forwards that into the merchant's acquirer bank, and then the acquirer bank forwards that into the card network, Visa, Master, Amex, whatever and then the card network forwards it into the issuer bank who issued that credit card to the customer. And at that point, the issuer bank can get a 
real-time verification from the customer whether this was um, a transaction um, uh, initiated by that customer. And then once that is done, it comes back through each of those hops back again in order to complete this transaction. And settlement happens many days later anyway. Now the problem with this is that there are so many hops and two times it's going over this, these five different hops that it leaves a lot of room for error, especially when there are disputes. And of course, to begin with, you have to have a credit card to do this. In the PSD2 world, the third party, and in this case, it's called a PISP, or a Payment Initiation Service Provider, comes in, in, into the middle and integrates everyone together, like an ESB would. What it does is it integrates the merchant's bank and the customer's bank and all this entire, got to be too excited there. Um, it integrates this entire system together so that you don't need to do a credit card transaction. So the custom experience would be, so the customer would check out this camera for 260 euros. <laughs> And basically, when he wants to pay, he will be um, provided different options uh, or different bank options that he could pick to um, do this transaction with. And then once you select the bank, you are then redirected to the bank's um, authentication um, process where you authenticate yourself. In the, in the case of PSD2, uh, it requires two-factor authentication, so you would provide your user credentials, and you would provide a second factor, such as a uh, one-time password, and then the bank needs to capture the user's consent or the customer's consent to go ahead with this transaction, because now this transaction it was initiated by a third party. So you would provide that consent, and then the transaction is done. That's great, isn't it? So this is just the beginning. And these third parties tip to be the new uh, fintechs who are very skilled at providing better customer experiences, have the power to provide customer experiences much better than, the, than what I showed you. So there's a lot of potential for how banking will change as a result of this. So that's great news for the customers, right? I'm really looking forward to it, and I'm sure most of you are too. But for the banks, this is not good. They are now, it's, it's bad enough that, that we want it to be like electricity and going to the background and all of that, but now they are further commoditized. They have become a commodity to these newer, more fashionable, more skilled, fintechs that are coming up as third parties. The competitive dynamics have changed because these new entrants are now coming into this picture and, and having, a, having a piece of that pie. The business model and identity of the banks are changing. They used to be the sole service providers of banking, and now they have to share this landscape with all these new entrants. The customer relationships are changing because previously the banks used to own the customer. They used to own the customer information. And now, in the matter of two months and six days, they have to just give away all that exclusivity they had to the customer. And as a result, especially because banks are now put in this level playing field where a customer can just very simply compare one against the other, the bank's revenue stands to, um, is, at, is, is at stake. So there's a huge, this has been viewed as a huge threat to the banking industry, especially for the banks. So why, why am I giving you so much bad news? Because I have good news. Did someone say consolidated customer financials? I think I did. There's a huge opportunity for banks if they focus on this. Let me explain. Now, 
In this ecosystem, whether the third party is providing payment initiation or account information, what this creates at the level of the third party is consolidated customer account and payment information across multiple banks. This has information about customers across banks, all the financial information of customers. And if banks had access to this data set, imagine the insights that they can get out of it. They can understand their current customers, but in a larger scope. They can understand their current customers' financial position across banks. They can understand who their non-customers are and try to understand how they can reach those customers. So the potential for banks to really use this rich resource of data is huge. But this is now kept at the third party level. So how do banks get access to this data? So while we are pondering on this, Accenture did a research last year where they interviewed a large number of banking consumers, face-to-face -face interviews, um, uh, in the UK and in Ireland, where they asked a couple of questions. And one of the questions they asked were, who do you want this third-party um, provider to be? Would you want it to be the technology companies? Would you want it to be the fintechs? Would you want it to be the traditional banks? And 76% of the respondents said that they prefer these third parties to be played by the traditional banks. The reason they said that was because everybody is new to this, and at least initially, consumers are more comfortable letting the financial institutions or, or the banks who have been the gatekeeper to their financial information to now handle that sensitive information. So this trust has to be built over the years where the newer entrants are also able to convince the customers of their ability to maintain that trust. But at least at the beginning, there's a huge opportunity for banks to provide this service themselves. Now, what that enables a bank to do is have access to this extremely important and insightful data set, which is consolidated customer financials. So imagine this customer, John Doe. Imagine if he, were having, if he was having a 100,000 euro account at Bank B. Now, Bank B is also providing the third-party service, and the customer gives consent for Bank B to see his balances across other banks. And he sees that John Doe has a 1 million euro account at Bank A, and has a 2 million euro account at Bank C. The moment Bank B knows this, it immediately changes John Doe's, category of, John Doe's categorization within the bank from where he is to fall into the million, million euro category. And what that enables a bank to do is to now understand this guy's financial picture as a whole and offer him a better interest rate for deposits over three million, for example, attracting those funds spread across other banks into bank B. In the case of business banking, this is even more important because for businesses, they are now able to provide the data that sometimes is very difficult for banks to get access to in order to get uh, credit facilities. So this ecosystem now provides ability for both personal banking as well as business banking to, to thrive and, and, and really flourish where the data is now shared. And customers will share their data with um, with a third party or with a bank in exchange for better financial services, in exchange for better banking services. All right. So that's with regards to market expansion. But how about the opportunities for creating new digital products? Now, this data set, which has customer payment information, for example, has a lot of information in there that is useful not just to the banks, but also to the other industries. 
For example, this data set has information about the type of things that are being purchased, the kind of holidays people are taking, the locations they're going to, the airlines they're taking to fly over there, the cars that are uh, fast moving, literally and metaphorically. So this information, or this data set, has a lot of insights in there that is useful for other businesses. And banks can leverage that by anonymizing and aggregating this data and providing insights to these businesses, to these other industries. They are now able to attract better and newer revenue streams by selling these insights for other businesses. So this is that electricity moment for banking. This is where banks can move into customers', uh, customers lifestyles, become a part of customer lifestyle, and, and let the customer do banking without feeling that, that they're doing the banking. So there's a, this regulation that was originally viewed as a threat and a cost has now swiftly moved towards an opportunity which banks can take to really digitally transform themselves, build new digital businesses, new, uh, new digital products, provide new digital services, and completely use this opportunity or use this regulation to become a better business. Now, all of that sounds great, but how do you really do that? What do you need to get to that um, get to that end goal of digitally transforming your bank. You need something more than technology. It's not just, it cannot be achieved only with technology. You need the vision. Banks need to look at this not as a regulation or a cost or a threat, but as a digital transformation opportunity. When they view that as an opportunity, the investment they, they want to make for it and the seriousness within which they manage the transformation, then helps banks to achieve that goal. In terms of people, it is no longer, in the beginning, when the, when the compliance requirement came along, it was first a problem for compliance department and the IT department. Now, it is no longer limited to that audience. It is now an opportunity for everyone, for personal banking, for corporate banking, for risk management, for marketing. Even the janitor needs to know how this is going to change his, his work life. Maybe there's going to be less people at the bank. So that's the people angle. And then in, when, in, when it comes to the culture, there's a huge change now for banks. For years and years, banks had complete ownership of their customers. Loyalty that they had for years and years. And now, Months and days, it's changing, where banks need to compete with all these new entrants to, to stay in there, to thrive and to survive. And of course, technology. We are a technology company, so it gets its own slide. When it comes to technology, it's not a PST2 compliance software or an open banking software that can get you there. You need the key technology components that can both get you compliant, but also take you each step of the way into digital transformation. So you will need some of these key elements in order to be agile and in order to be adaptable to get to that end goal. You'll need API management to expose your data. You need to integrate multiple systems on an ongoing basis. You'll need uh, identity and access management to ensure that uh, your uh, customer financials are secure. And obviously, you need analytics to derive these insights that can become the digital products and services that can bring you new revenue. So at WSO2, we have done most of the hard work We've taken these technology components and we've created a solution which is componentized so that banks can take 
any of these components, when they are ready, whether it be for compliance, whether it be to uh, be able to provide third party services, or whether it be to digitally transform itself. You can check it out. If you go to our website and go into solutions and find the open banking solution, there's, um, you can play around with it um, and, and see what's in there. So what this has really done is that it has taken this regulation that was originally viewed as a threat and a cost and made it to an opportunity where banking services seamlessly transform themselves into providing that end goal to the customer without the customer really feeling it. So for banking industry, this came, this digital transformation opportunity came as, came disguised as a regulation. And for all the other industries, this can come as anything. This can come as a regulation, it can come as um, market trends or patterns, it can come as the rise or fall of industries, it can even come as changes in social norms. This picture over here, in this corner, in the, in the right corner, it makes us believe that these five young people who are looking at their phones are really happy. They're not interacting with each other, they're not playing cricket, but they're happy. This could be a digital transformation opportunity for one of your industries. So open your eyes and ears and unmask your digital transformation opportunity today. Thank you very much.